so thank you um, for coming. Uh, these are thoughts and a work in progress, and they're prompted by a couple of things. One is walking through the galleries and thinking about what we have on display, and it's, as you probably know, next to impossible not to walk through the galleries and think about the stuff we have on display. And then when you couple that with walking through the back building, um, it actually gets deafening, so it's hard not to think about this stuff. There's also been a, a kind of a rolling, intermittent conversation going on in the background between James and Jeremy and myself and some others about our current exhibits and what they do say and what they don't say and then when you factor in the possibility of having a new building someday that prompts the consideration of the next round of exhibits and what they might say which then makes you walk back out on the floor and look at the exhibits we do have and this advanced a little further last week when Jeremy and I, actually earlier, early this week when Jeremy and I met some people from the design exchange in Toronto who would like to borrow some of our stuff for a show they're doing this summer about things that have been made in Canada. But in the course of walking through our exhibits with them, uh, it again prompted us to think and talk about our own exhibits and the collection and, and what else it could do. So these are um, some thoughts. They're really thoughts about uh, not just individual artifacts, but about something that I'm always really keen on, which is the relationship between artifacts. And I keep saying to people that when we moved the collection into Five Bay and took the plastic off, and those of you who remember the wrapped up in plastic days know that I mean, it was obvious there was a lot of stuff in there, but it really, you couldn't do anything with it because it was all wrapped up in plastic and it was dark. So you bring him into that well-lit room and you take the plastic off and all of a sudden you walk in and it's like you're interrupting a conversation because the canoes are all talking to each other and, and all of a sudden you can see all of those shapes and resemblances and think about the connections and you just see stuff. You could have been looking at that for 20 years and not seen it until you brought in the light and took the plastic off. So. That's something that really intrigues me because there's a, an almost infinite number of stories back there and there's stories associated with particular things but there's even more stories that arrive from combinations of things and that's sort of what I've been thinking about so far. Uh, this also started with uh, Candace's idea I think to have people associated with the museum talk about their favorite things. And so this is kind of also kind of an extended favorite thing talk. So um, my favorite thing <laughs> um, uh, is really um, two favorite things that will start with um, thing one, as is appropriate. So uh, first I want to ask you a question. I don't know how many of you, who here was alive in 1968? <laughs> and when you were, unless you're really into retro culture, when you were and you watched TV, did you ever anybody ever watch a show called The Prisoner? The what? The Prisoner, Patrick McGowan series, oh, yeah. wonderful, crazy, off the wall, enigmatic, evocative. Patrick McGowan's a British secret agent. He quits in disgust one day, storms out of the office, and then he kind of wakes up in this weird little place where everybody has a number and nobody has a name, and he ends, ends up being assigned number six. He spends a lot of time talking to number two, who's down there in the lower right-hand corner. But the big question for the whole series, which he never really finds out until the end, which just turns the whole thing inside out anyways, the big question always is, who is number one? Right? It's the big, it's, it, it, this is available on DVD and video. I highly recommend it. It's really, it's amazing television for 1968. So, Who's number one? And that's my question for today. If you were to say, what is the most noteworthy artifact in our whole collection of 600-ish canoes, what, what would our number one be? And we should think about how we can determine that. It probably wouldn't be, not necessarily the oldest, although it could be, but that wouldn't automatically make something number one. Uh, I think it wouldn't necessarily be the rarest one, although, again, it's possible, but I don't think any of these things are automatic. Uh, it probably wouldn't necessarily be the most valuable or expensive. Um, and although it's tempting, I would say it certainly uh, wouldn't be the most beautiful artifact in the collection, partly because that's a giant yawning tar pit of subjectivity anyways. But none of those things, I don't think, would automatically make something our most important artifact. Uh, what I would suggest is a useful way of thinking about that, though, 
is to pick the most significant artifact as our number one artifact. So that's great, that's all very tidy, but what do we mean by significance? Well, I think to be significant here in terms of the artifacts in the collection, you should think about the connections that our number one artifact has, the connections to other artifacts in the collection. And that's a bit like the way the internet works, you know, the more websites your website's connected to, the higher your rank in the search engines because they take that as the sign of, of how significant it is. That other people read it and refer to it and tie into it. Um, you could also say that a significant artifact would be one that had caused a lot of other things to happen. Um, you could also look at it in terms of it as an effect, not a cause. So, was it the product of other significant things that happened, significant people, significant events, other things that have taken place? And finally, um, you could say that it might be the most significant artifact because of the changes which took place as a result of its existence. So these are all maybe um, a little more useful as filters rather than just the longest, the widest, the oldest, all the kind of stuff that's on the tourist circuit, you know. That people are always asking us, too, what's the oldest thing in the collection? Well, I don't know. And, and why does it matter, really? Um, so if you, if you have those in mind, let's try this out. Let's say, um, let's look at pleasure boating, because canoes are part of pleasure boating, right? So if somebody <coughs> said to you, uh, what is one of the fastest pleasure boats you can think of, you might propose uh, one of Garwood's uh, wonderful Miss America speedboats. That's Miss America 10. Those are four supercharged <laughs> Packards. He and his mechanic are sitting behind them. <laughs> okay, so fastest pleasure boat. There's a good possibility. <coughs> now it gets through this objective. Most beautiful pleasure boat. Well, I don't know. One of my personal favorites. That's Reliance. That's Hershoff's 1903 America's Cup Defender. Just a great over the top, that's like 135 feet of sailboat, and just great, over the top, magnificent, spectacular, utterly useless, but gloriously so. Okay, so that's most beautiful. Um, largest, well, there's lots of possibilities. This is Emily Cadwallader's yacht, Savonarona. This was one elderly woman's private yacht, largest private yacht in the world when it was built. Uh, those are all good suggestions. So we got fastest, most beautiful, biggest. But but if somebody, not, not yet, <laughs> but if somebody said, okay, not fastest, most beautiful, or biggest, what's the most significant pleasure boat in the history of pleasure boating according to those criteria you just look at, you'd get very different answers, right? So let's do that. Let's say, what's the most significant pleasure boat? Well, there's one possibility. That's a snark. It's made of styrofoam. And for a while, you could send in your cool cigarette labels and get one with the cool cigarette logo on the sale. These things got promoted in popular mechanics. They made hundreds of thousands of them. And it's remarkable how many people you talk to say, I, we have one of those at the cottage, we have these, one of these. And they're still littering the country. They're all over the place, too. So that is a pretty significant pleasure boat because it got a lot of people out in the water. So is that. That's a 13-foot Boston Whaler. That is the boat that launched Boston Whaler on the road to commercial success. And again, for an awful lot of people, that's the first boat they owned, or they still have one, and they made <coughs> thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And that also changed the face of pleasure building. Um, you say, well, I don't know. OK, so you got the snark. What about sailboats? What about the boat that got more people into sailing than any other small boat? That's got to be the laser, right? Bruce Kirby's absolutely just game-changing boat. Just, just blew the whole thing wide open. Canadian design. Canadian design. Uh, and if you ask about a boat that got a lot of people into canoeing, of course, you would need to bring in an aluminum canoe. <laughs> Those are four very different boats from the three that we just looked at. So no surprise to anybody, the question and the way you frame the question yields um, a very different answer. So um, back to our question about what's the most significant artifact in the Canoe Museum's collection. Uh, and in my uh, rather idiosyncratic opinion, uh, I would like to respectfully suggest that it is this one. Uh, it's Harmony, George Mellis Douglas's double paddle canoe. Uh, 
This is one of the reasons we're sitting in here, because of course this is in the back building, and I didn't think it was a good day for a park tour, so we're just looking at pictures at the moment. Unfortunately not on display at the moment, but it will be uh, in due course. This is an interesting boat, and the more you look at it, in some ways, the less we know. There's some lack of clarity about when this thing was built. Uh, a transcript of an article that its owner published in Forest and Stream in 1886 says, quote, this canoe was built in the year 1856, a year before Mr. McGregor brought canoeing into the notice of the public by the publication of an account of his cruise in the Yall Rob Roy. Well, that's great, except that McGregor's book was published in 1866. So is that Douglas 20 years later looking back and getting his dates wrong? Is it a typo in Forest and Stream? Don't know yet, and I confess I have not had a chance to go to Metro Ref and look at the original Forest and Stream piece, but we can we can check that out. So, might be 1856. Um, another source I looked at said 1854, with no reference at all, and another source still said between 1862 and 1864. Anyways, if this boat was built in 1856, this is a truly astonishing artifact because this is 10 years before McGregor, who is generally acknowledged to be the father of modern pleasure canoeing, built his boat and took his first cruise. So if that's the case, Douglas was so far out ahead of the curve, he was basically off the page. If it's 1866, then it's contemporaneous and I can understand that. So that's an interesting thing to ponder and we'll look at it a little more in the future. In any case, very significant boat. Why? Why so significant? Well. Harmony is a link. She's part of a chain of cause and effect that um, ties this world, this almost immemorial world of circumpolar, skin on frame, aboriginal watercraft, and she ties it, that world, into this world, which is the world of pleasure canoeing that we all know and love that began in the middle of the 19th century. And she ties it in in a very direct and causal sort of way. So harmony as an artifact connects um, this gallery. <coughs> you might know that one. It's upstairs. <laughs> with this gallery downstairs. And you'll notice as we talk that a lot of these things I'm talking about are not present in our galleries right now. Right? We've got a chunk here and a chunk here. But unless you do this on your tour and somebody mentions it, None of our visitors see any of this connecting stuff. Not yet. Not yet. So how is she a link? How does she tie that gallery and that gallery together? Well, she does that through our friend here, Mr. McGregor, who also, incidentally, is nowhere mentioned in our galleries at this point. And yet, uh, in, in the same way that Kurt Whipper is the father of the Canoe Museum, John McGregor is the father of anybody that's ever gone out in a canoe for pleasure in any sort of systematic way. Um, McGregor's a, a neat guy. Uh, he's another one of those people where you tend to hear the same four or five things about him, but the more you look at him, the more interesting he gets. He was a, a lawyer, an adventurer, uh, a muscular Christian uh, in both senses of the word because he was a very active guy, but he also traveled with a canoe full of Protestant tracts, which he gave out uh, when he stopped to give <coughs> lectures. Uh, and beginning in 1865, he traveled literally the length and breadth of Europe um, in a series of little canoes called Rob Roy that he had built. And he did this uh, at a time when people just did not go out on the water in small boats for fun. I mean, people's idea then of cruising was um, something like uh, Lady Brassie's wonderful book about steam yachting, you know, uh, cruise on a yacht, Sunbeam, about her and her husband taking a cruise. Well, Sunbeam was like 97 feet long and had a crew of 12. And a, so here's this guy in this little 15 foot long canoe and people thought he was mad. They thought he was absolutely mad, and they turned out to watch him go down the river, partly because they were all probably secretly hoping he was going to drown himself, and it would be a spectacle to watch. So this was, this was a game changer, to use that phrase again, when McGregor did this. And that's why I'm saying if Harmony was built 10 years before McGregor started doing this, then that's really, really singular. If she was built at the same time, it's understandable. So he's got this little canoe called Rob Roy. Where did Rob Roy come from? Because everything comes from somewhere. Um, in 1858, McGregor had traveled through the U.S. and Canada, and he talks about paddling a dugout and about paddling birch bark canoes. Uh, 
before that, he had also been to um, Siberia, <coughs> uh, possibly to some of the same places that James has been and is about to go, and had seen skin on frame watercraft in Siberia as well. He brought all of those impressions back with him to Europe, then went to a boat builder called Searle and Sons uh, up in Lambeth on the Thames and asked them to build him a canoe. So what he did though is he told them and maybe drew a sketch of what he'd seen, but he's talking to a European boat builder that builds Thames skiffs and things like that. So they took his idea and did what boat builders and canoe builders often do. They married it up with the techniques that they know best because they didn't know anything about it. First of all, they didn't have a lot of access to walrus skin and they also didn't know anything about lashed together construction like this. They knew about good old fashioned European Viking style boat building. So what they produced was a 15 foot long, partially decked over boat made of oak weighing about 80 pounds, which you paddle with a double-bladed paddle. And McGregor, being a good Scottish guy, of course, uh, called it Rob Roy. In fact, he called all of his boats Rob Roy, which leads to some confusion, because a number of museums feel like they have a Rob Roy, or the Rob Roy, but it's really just a Rob Roy. So they're scattered all over the place. <laughs> um, the word gets overused today, and I'm a little reluctant to mention it, but Rob Roy, I think, truly was a hybrid. She was an intercultural artifact where a visual impression from one culture got married up with a technology from another culture and something new arose from the conjunction of the two of those. So not a kayak because uh, you couldn't roll her. You tip over, you fall out, you swim to shore, you write the book. A double paddle canoe, strictly speaking. Is what, and that's certainly what McGregor called her. Uh, a lot heavier at 80 pounds, a lot heavier than those skin on frame kayaks, but also a lot more durable. Uh, decked over, but the cockpit was, you know, two and a half, three feet long. Sat down, and he had a, a, a rubberized canvas Macintosh apron, he called it, that he would snap onto the cockpit and sort of put loosely in his lap. So it was keeping the spray out, but it wasn't fastening you to the boat the same way a spray deck fastens you to a boat. Um, he went all over town in these boats. He wrote, he lectured, he exhibited the boat with them, and had a whole series of uh, wonderfully picaresque adventures and, and wrote these charming books or even lists all the stuff that he carries with them and gives you advice about how to paddle and what to pack and what not to pack and where to go and talks endlessly about his trouble even in finding maps because people just haven't mapped this stuff because nobody went out in boats like this. So this was just, this was really something to have this mad Englishman sort of paddle through, paddle down the Danube, you know, through your town and offer to give a lecture that he got, he got mobbed, probably got marriage proposals too, he got absolutely mobbed by <laughs> The crowd. <coughs> so Rob Roy herself became famous, McGregor became famous, but Rob Roy, the type of boat, became famous as well. And these early recreational canoes were big on classifying canoes by type. So the Rob Roy type, which usually meant a small, lab straight, double paddle canoe, became one of the really significant types of early canoeing. And people often talk about, I have a Rob Roy too, which means they had a canoe, something like that. Uh, we have two others. Uh, in our collection of the Rob Roy type. One of them, uh, also not on display yet, is this charming little uh, cedar rib canoe. This is about 13 feet long in the back building. Mine is its deck, unfortunately, but Peter Rowe Museum has one of these with the deck on it. That is a Rob Roy, and that is, therefore, the Peterborough Canoe Company or Ontario Canoe Company's response to that offering a boat in that type. We also have um, another wonderful boat that Hopefully we'll be able to come off the ceiling someday. This is a boat called Perdita that was owned by George Douglas, um, now hanging upside down uh, as a dust accumulator in the Peterborough Traditions Gallery. Uh, longer than um, the little Ontario Canoe Company boat um, and built longitudinal strip and not cedar rib, but again, very much that Rob Roy type. Sit down, look where you're going, sit in your rear and use a double paddle with a, with a decked over boat. Neither one of those boats is identified at this point also um, as being a Rob Roy type. So let's look again at Harmony. Where did Harmony come from? Because Harmony, I should say, is uh, coming up on 20 feet long. So she's longer than a Rob Roy, certainly shallower in her depth, and um, uh, just a, a different shape of hull, not nearly as robust or, or heavy duty. So she had to come from somewhere. Well, I think one of the places she came from is here. Uh, by the middle of the 19th century, uh, competitive rowing was uh, big, big time and getting bigger all the time. 
uh, university rowing scene in the UK, especially in Great Britain, was huge. And there were any number of boat builders that specialized in building uh, rowing singles like that. And so I think what happened is that um, when Douglas went to commission this boat, uh, he went to a boat builder who built rowing shells. In this case, we know that he went to a guy named William Biffin in Hammersmith and commissioned him to build him a double paddle canoe. And he might have described it, but again, what the boat builder did is took his notion, much like Serle and Son had done for um, McGregor, took his notion and married it up. So they took that idea and married it up with one of their rowing shells and what resulted is that because this boat is used as a canoe, described by its owner as a canoe, but it's effectively a rowing shell. It's long, it's slim, it's um, um, a kind of, again, a sort of semi-hybrid form. So they took a rowing shell and they decked it over. Uh, interesting to read in Douglas's notes that originally this boat didn't have wood, had wooden decks now, but originally had decks of varnished silk tacked on, and that's exactly how one builds a rowing shell because you're looking to save weight. So that to me would just be more proof that what they really did is took their took their standard single, which might be 20 to 25 feet long, depending on the size of the sculler, stuck a cockpit in it, made a made a footrest, and said, "Here's your new canoe, Mister." Mr. Douglas. The, the formal resemblance here, if, and if you walk into a rowing club boathouse, I mean that, it's like you're looking at the end of a sculling single, not, not a canoe. Are you saying that George Douglas commissioned this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Campbell. Sorry, Campbell. Oh, his father. Yeah, well, oh, father, yeah. Okay, okay. You talk about Rob Rice, I mean, these families where they all get the same yeah. name, you know, yeah. it's, yeah, we're back. <laughs> Sorry, Campbell Douglas. Um, so I think we have a rowing shell but a rowing shell turned into a canoe, which is a, an illustration of several things, including uh, how when you go to innovate, you often, you, well, you innovate from somewhere, so you innovate out of what you know best, and then you push it a little further. Um, an illustration of how persistent uh, the makers of things are in terms of their skill, right? So you know how to make something one way, and even if you're involving a new idea, you're still basing on what you already know and what you already do. And uh, an illustration also just of how new this notion was, that people didn't invent this watercraft form out of nowhere. They took an idea and an existing form and stuck them together and produced something newish. Um, just so much, really so much like a rowing shell. I have to keep reminding myself that we are looking at the stern of this boat too, not the bow. So that little <coughs> covered area is actually behind you when you paddle. Um, not that there's much to separate the stern and the bow. Uh, also built in sections, uh, and if you look down um, there, that's a little thumb screw on a threaded rod that came through from the other side of the bulkhead. This uh, brass strip now covers the joint of the deck, and at some point the three halves got permanently joined together, but she was built in order to be transportable. McGregor solved this by making Rob Roy only 15 feet long so that she'd fit in a railway baggage car. The option here with a longer boat was to make it in sections, so you would unscrew unscrew that, it'd come apart, each part had a bulkhead, and then you'd reassemble it when you got, when you got where you were going. Uh, I'm not proposing that we disassemble her, but she, I hope, will certainly show up in our Canoes to Go exhibit as an example of a, of a canoe to go, because again, there's no other way to get your canoe, you know, over the Danube than to ship her somehow, somewhere by, um, by rail, probably. Um, that's thing one. Why does she wear it? Thing two. Douglas says that, you know, obviously she's heavier than she used to be because she's now got a wooden deck and so on. She, a, a, a single, a rowing single of that size might be 25 to 30 pounds. I suspect she's more like 40, 45 or something. You know, there's some repairs, there's some wood on the deck now, there's some extra foot braces and pieces. Not a whole lot, less than, less than Rob Roy. Uh, interesting though too that, that at the time um, she was kind of retired for a while from active service because he said he found her too light for his intended uses. So you certainly couldn't probably stuff as much baggage in there. as you, When you look at McGregor's book he's got this long two-page list of all of the stuff he carried with him and not, not as high capacity a boat. 
Today. Yeah. Why do you think if they had that model and they had the the uh, publicity because of those books and things like that, when they were in the era of recreation of community building, that that model didn't take off more? Oh, but it did. So there's there's a, there's a couple there's a couple strains in recreational canoeing. Um, there's the Rob Roy sort of paddling people. McGregor's boat. All remember that one engraving had his boat also had sails. And he didn't have any lateral planes, so no centerboard or anything, so he could only sail kind of downwind. But when the wind was right, he would put up his little rig. So you've got paddling with a double paddle, you've got a sailing canoe, and that was kind of the first strain when recreational canoeing got going, and they called them traveling canoes. So you were able to paddle or sail, and it was more or less a 50-50 boat. People used them for some tremendously long journeys, like, for instance, going from the headwaters of the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico in a pair of small traveling canoes like that. Uh, when these canoes were classifying their boats, and, and they, and they all wrote in magazines, they wrote for outing in the field and forest and stream, and argued endlessly about different types of boats. It's like reading a hot rod magazine, they're arguing back and forth about my type and my type. So they, were, they would classify them. So something like that would be a paddling, sailing canoe, a true 50-50 mixture, where you could do either. And the boat wasn't optimized for either one, but it could do both. One end of the scale was more towards sailing, and one end of the scale was more towards, so there were paddling sailing canoes, paddleable sailing canoes, sailable paddling canoes, and different types. So there was another English type of canoe, the first of which was called the Nautilus. So that became the Nautilus type. You had the ringleader type. You had the shadow type. And each of those had its own adherence. And they were all more or less optimized for particular things. So then you've got all those decked over boats with a very strong European influence as kind of one branch of the family, then the, what they called an open canoe, or a Canadian canoe, was the other branch of the family. And they were all at the meets together, all through the 1880s and 1890s. Endless discussion about which is better for which one's faster. Um, people would race the open Canadian canoes, but with a double-bladed paddle instead of a single paddle. So they're all, all there as different branches of the canoe family. So they did very much stay. And what the Rob Roy's turned into in Germany in the 1930s is folding kayaks. When you have Hypalon invented, right, which is the rubberized canvas that they cover Zeppelins with, all of a sudden you've got the German drive to be outdoors and strong and clean and healthy. We all know where that led but later on. But in the 1930s, German outdoorsmen and adventurers are creating folding kayaks. That's where the Klepper came from. So that strain really never went away. It just kind of went underground and popped back up again. And again, all connections that we would love to be able to make here through, um, through an exhibit. Thing two maybe isn't quite as significant, but thing two is just a boat I really, really, really like. Um, I see this boat in my dreams, actually. This is a Herald Canoe Company motor canoe. Uh, wonderful photo of it in its prime. Um, the idea of motors in canoes, this is a, this is a wonderful notion, uh, kind of counterintuitive. Um, so by the standards of what I'll show you in a minute, this is actually a very tame motor canoe, because it's still more or less a canoe. Um, <laughs> this is uh, pushed a little further. On the Upper Thames, there were a whole series of uh, people's efforts to adapt. And again, these Canadian canoes got shipped over by companies like Peterborough, prompted these very ang anglicized canoes. This is a steam-powered canoe. This is an Upper Thames steam-powered recreational canoe from the end of the 19th century, a little tiny steam engine, boiler, firebox, he's sitting back there, you know, stoking the firebox. Coal? <laughs> uh, coal, probably, yeah, for its efficiency. Um, these things show up at each other, and they're just, you know, just the whole notion of a steam-powered canoe is just so, <laughs> so delightfully off the wall. Um, not yet. Not yet, but for about uh, 15, 16,000 pounds, you could pick one up at an auction, because they are at, these are, show up in the sort of UK antique boating scene the same way varnished mahogany speedboats show up in our antique boating scene over here. Um, this is a modern one. They also got electric engines put in. This is a plywood glued plank, plywood one that you can go. But again, a big canoe. Too big to paddle, but of course still, you know, still very much a canoe. Still very much that form. This one happens to have an electric motor as a pleasure canoe from an English company. Um, this, is, this is a motor canoe, too. This is a trick question. This is the world's fastest canoe. Right? 1906, uh, a guy named Fred Marriott 
drove this steam powered steam powered race car to a new world land speed record of 127.6 miles per hour steam on steam. steam. On steam. The steam car thing is another one of my enthusiasms because <laughs> it's a bit like the way you know all the cities got their streetcars taken away because of General Motors and the American government in the 1940s. Well, steam powered cars got killed by evil forces because they were actually a tremendously useful and efficient and interesting technology just died a premature death. Anyhow, this is a steam powered race car. Why is this a canoe? Because the upper part of the body here was built by the J.R. Robertson Canoe Factory in Massachusetts. <laughs> Where else do you go to find a streamlined, pointy on both ends, double ending form? So this does technically count as a fast canoe. <laughs> Back to canoes that float. Uh, another underappreciated canoe in our collection, around which there is has recently been a flurry of interest. This is a cedar strip canoe. This is the very, very, very big brother or sister to the one that I showed you earlier, the little Rob Roy type. This is a big motor canoe. I mean, how long is this? Like 20 feet, 19, 20 feet? Uh, built cedar rib technique, the biggest one we've ever seen. Uh, missing its power plant, unfortunately, but uh, very definitely a motor canoe, languishing in the back. A magnificent specimen, really, of the canoe builder's art, and one that I think has a lot to offer us. Doesn't have its um, engine, but does have the does have the running gear. What's that? Do we, on, on is it Ontario Canoe Company? No, that's a Peterborough Canoe Company. Where was it Peterborough? Oh, we don't know that. Uh, well, probably, probably in the This was a, this was a Candelar era acquisition, yeah, wasn't it? You were yeah. saying so. Um, all these motor canoes are powered by little single or two-cylinder, you know, make and break engines like this. Um, charming power plants that are, of course, connect, collected and appreciated in their own right. Um, to this canoe, I just the shape of this thing drives me absolutely wild. This is just an absolute, an absolute, absolute symphony of curves. Like just, just this, just this bow view alone. You know, there's something, there's a lot going on here. Long, slim boat. This is the point. This is sort of the interesting part of the canoe. You look at the end, and there's a lot of stuff going on. It's a tricky thing to build. It's a tricky thing to design. And one of the things that this canoe embodies, even in its later years here, um, is just is this Peterborough bow. This this shape. Right. This is not the kind of chestnut Hiawatha, you know, super recurve. It's not the low flat shear length you get in a lot of modern boats. This is just, this is almost gothic the way this goes. You know, we've got a stem that's almost, almost plumb but not quite. Comes back a little bit. We've got this great kick at the end. We've got these lovely wide inwells that taper down to almost nothing, and it's just, it's a shape that manages to look kind of bouncy and serene. There's a lot of dynamism because of the curves, but it's also resolved so that the curves don't just fly off into space. It's like they all converge and it's a hard thing to draw, it's a hard thing to build, and it's something where there's a lot of subtlety and the more you look at it, the more interesting it gets. John, is that utilitarian at all or is that just sort of a flight of fancy on the part of the builders? Oh, good question. <laughs> um, no question it would be harder to use in a crosswind. <laughs> because we've got more stem up there. But fancy is it's a bit um, more flamboyant. Sure, but flamboyance and fancy is utilitarian as well. Well, and and this is something again we we talk about in the galleries a lot. You know, um, there are some really elaborate theories advanced to explain why, for instance, a long nose birch bark canoe is a long nose birch bark canoe. Well, oh, but it's for harvesting rice, and it it parts the stems of the rice. You know what? Maybe they just liked the way it looked, too. And it was made by a person. So somewhere in here is this stew, this concatenation of the nature of your materials, your own particular skill level, your own visual analogs and history, what else you've seen, what you liked, what you don't like, what you think is proper, what you think is improper. Somewhere in here, too, are the physical shapes of the rest of the canoe because this does allow you, this up curve does allow you to draw the plank out and get a really fine, fine bow. And if we look back to, um, oops, that's a fine, narrow, fine bow in that canoe. So it's a tremendously easily driven hull form. It doesn't have any of that sort of um, apple cheekedness you get in some shorter boats where this is actually a convex curve. This is almost, almost straight, but in order to be able to draw the planks out, you have to have a place for them to go. And so if you bring that stem up, it lets you do that. 
because you can't just sort of take a beach ball and stick a point on it. You have to marry all those curves together. So it's a real combination. The, the untangling of why something looks the way it does, that's what museums do with exhibits. They look at things and understand what caused them to be what they are. Is it, you know, in any given case, how much form, how much function, how much use, how much the background of the maker, how much the background of the user, how much, you know, look at the custom car thing. Here's a car. Well, are people satisfied with that? No, they want to fiddle with it, right? They want to do this, do it, do that. I can't imagine that there isn't somewhere like a young Mennonite kid who's hopped up the buggy, right? Like he's just <laughs> the back end, he's lowered the front end, he's cut four inches off the roof because he's a person and it's an object and he just, it, no matter where you look, people modify their objects like that. So, um, if you wanted to talk about that, how would you refer to it? If to to that particular part of the boat? No, or? This, this boat. What do you call it? Well, um, you could just sort of list off its attributes. I mean, it's a, it's a wide board Harold Canoe Company inboard motor canoe, among other things. You could throw in some other, you know, um, it's got uh, raised battens on the seams inside, so you could draw out this long laundry list of, of sort of just its attributes, like so talking about the wheelbase and the horsepower and so on for a car. So if you were going to say to somebody, go out and look at the Green Herald, would they? I'd say Herald, the Herald Motor Canoe, yeah. yeah. Someday it'll have a big number on it. <laughs> and you can walk down the aisles in five day and, and see it. But a, a motor canoe would be a, not a bad place to start, yeah. yeah. Without the motor. Without the motor. Sans, sans motor at the moment. Um, but that, that shape, that, and, and that shape too also is, that's one of the reasons all these Peterborough canoes go to heaven. I mean, that's, that's, that's a Peterborough shape. You do not see that anywhere else. You see long, narrow bows on a canoe like a Morris, but you don't see this wonderful combination of that almost vertical <coughs> stem and that incredible kick up on the end. And if you go downstairs, for instance, and walk into the Land Becomes Canada and look up above you, there's a beautiful uh, sort of scuffed blue Herald canoe that has that same shape. The end of the big sailing canoe, uh, in, it wasn't all work is another Harold. It's a Harold Patton, but it's another Harold canoe with that same shape. And then look at all of those, and then walk up in the landing where we have the Payne dugout now, in Kirk's memory, and see if you don't see the nascent beginnings of that shape in the end of that, in the end of that Payne dugout. It's just sort of the family, family tree here when you put all these things side by side. By side. <coughs> um, a, shape, a shape worth considering, I think, uh, and a boat and a boat worth considering. There we go. Yeah, so there's a Herald canoe from Land Becomes Canada upside down now, but that, if anything, is even more, is even more pronounced. Also a wideboard boat. There's the end of the uh, Herald Patton canoe, and it wasn't a word. That happens to be the stern, but it's not a whole lot different than the bow. There's a William English, turn of the century, turn of the 20th century canoe, same sort of shape, not quite as extreme perhaps, but that wonderful sharp, sharp peak there. And finally, upside down, there is the end of the Payne dugout, which, although that particular boat is later in the 19th century, I think we sort of feel that it probably doesn't look all that different from an 1860s dugout, the one that people refer to when they talk about the birth of European canoe building in this area. Um, so, interpretively, and Fran's question was interesting, so here's what it looked like when it was being used, here's what it looks like now, it's a yawning gulf between those two things. If you just stuck this out in the gallery, now, oh look, there's an old canoe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right away, the ethical challenges start to come. <coughs> what do you do? Yeah. One approach would be to take this and make it all shiny. You could do that, what would disappear of that? Uh, is some of its character and a lot of its physical structure because there isn't a lot of wood in these things to restore. You end up replacing it instead of fixing it. So what you gain is something that looked more like the guy who built it and used it would have seen, which to a walk-in off the street visitor might help it make more sense. What you lose though is a lot of what this could tell you about how these things were made and built because you can look at this and see how they measured it, how they nailed it. You can see little pencil marks from when they were building it, measuring and cutting and fitting. And even though it's, you know, it's in its dotage here as an object, it has a lot to say. This is a real challenge for museums. In the past, 
the pendulum was very much in favor of restoration. Everything got made shiny, right? Cars got restored, boats got restored, technology got restored. You go to the Henry Ford Museum, everything's beautiful. It's all been repainted, sandblasted, restored, and put back together again. There is an argument for that, but you also lose a lot when you do that. And so this is a real, this is one of these places where it seems kind of obvious until you start to think about it for 10 minutes, and then you very quickly think yourself into a corner. And so this is one of the things that we'll wrestle with as we take something like that and think about how to make it whole again. The Rosa Parks bus. Um, the Rosa Parks bus. Yeah. Wasn't that a movie that they yeah. restored? Like a bus you'd never see a single yeah. bus. Now, the, the car world, the antique car world started a lot of this because they were really, really into restoration. They were into restoring things to be nicer than they ever looked when they came out of the factory. They've pulled back from that. And now at an antique car show, there's two streams. There's kind of a restoration stream and an original fabric stream where you actually get points for retaining as much of the original material of that car as you can. That's been a really healthy development. The same thing is happening in the antique boat world. So there is now a broader discussion about, well, it, it's actually okay to not have it be completely perfect. But again, this doesn't look like a canoe anybody would ever use. This looks like a canoe you'd have in your barn. <laughs> what about taking lines off it and reproducing? That was not a paid <laughs> that was not a paid remark. That was just a great, <laughs> no, just a great segue. No, no, that's wonderful. Because, because one of the things that we do as a museum is to do that, which gives us several things. First of all, it gives us a boat we can say to somebody, hey, try this. And secondly, in the course of measuring this and building it, you will learn 150% more than you know now about that. Guaranteed. Absolutely guaranteed. Your apprehension of not just the skills and knowledge to build it, but in the case of that red cedar rib motor canoe I showed you earlier, just the construction sequence of how the darn thing actually went together, um, all of that will become obvious to you. And the people who participate in that will then become the best interpreters on the floor because they'll be speaking out of that knowledge of hands and materials that actually do stuff. So we've already done that yeah. here with the art community. Yeah, so that's a wonderful, and, and one of the reasons that we're building the Living Tradition <coughs> Workshop downstairs is to do just that, to bring this thing, say, here's this thing, we're thinking about it, in the course of thinking about it, we're going to make one of them because that will help us think better about it. And it will also correct some erroneous impressions. And I guarantee you we'll find out stuff that we didn't, didn't think about before. And then we'll have a useful one. Still might want to do something with this. And that's, a, that's, going, to be an ongoing, that's going to be an ongoing challenge. Um, anyhow, those are, those, are two of my, those are two of my favorite things. And I wanted to end. Um, by apologizing, <laughs> uh, but I couldn't resist. Uh, and, I, and you're welcome to hum along. I'm not going to sing, but you're welcome to hum along. I felt I had to do a canoe museum version of the song here, too. I don't know if you want to add this. To Candace, you do. You do musical theater, don't you? Well, start it. We'll all sing I'll along. <laughs> sure. It, it does scan. You can't sing it. Okay. All right. Here we go. You have to sing too. Okay. Birch bark canoes and, and voyager sashes, old wooden paddles and point of sail crashes, relics in five bay all tied up with string. These are a few of my favorite things. Bill Mason's chestnut and Trudeau's canoe, obscure donations from heaven knows who. White water kayaks with duct tape and stings. These are a few of my favorite things. Pass and the ball of leaves and unburned by Warm wool and mittens and crafted by E.B. Hundreds of watercraft hanging in slings. These are a few of my favorite things. When the staff writes, when the roof leaks, when the budget's bad, I simply remember my favorite things, and then I don't feel so bad. I think you guys, I think you guys should go on the road. That's, that's good. That's good. We need print copies of that. Yeah, and now on to more important things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Does anyone have any? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.